want you just to start worshiping. You already have been. But we're going to sing, and I want you just to enter into such a state of worship that you forget who's around you. You forget everything but Him. What is it Michael Kuliana says? You're not worshiping until you've forgotten about yourself. It's not real worship until you've forgotten even about yourself. So I want us to go into that realm this night. sing a song if you look in the book it's number 162 and almost just like I feel like to sing this song just to like set the atmosphere that because one of the things that we always say is when you come just to let go of your week's struggles you know your your whether you're tired from the week that you've had to go through so far you know it's someday we're almost we're halfway uh, but we're just declaring that we're just going to sing this song and just give in to just peace just taking a deep breath yeah. and just letting everything go to let go and fall into his presence this night. Again, it's number 162, breathe. This goes out to the word. This goes out to the stress. Sorting out a million thoughts running through your head. To everyone that's waiting for better days ahead Tired and frustrated and leaving words unsaid Please don't hold your breath Just breathe Cause it's a miracle
taking air again, breathing, I'm breathing in oxygen. I can feel my strength coming back again. my heart. I can feel my heart. There it goes again. It's beating. I'm breathing in oxygen. One more time. I can feel my heart. I can feel my heart. There it goes again. It's beating. I'm breathing in oxygen. Time, just breathe, just breathe, cause it's a miracle we can breathe, this power in the way that we breathe, release your heavy burdens and let everything that has breath, pray. Worship, this is why you have breath. it's not much farther it's just one page back it's number 159 this is wait on you because that's what we do we wait on him and while we wait on the Lord we know that he's going to come through every single time when we wait on him and we know that when we wait we're not just sitting back and just waiting for it to happen but as we wait and while we wait we're just entwining ourselves up in him Getting to know Him more, drawing closer to Him, you, knowing that He's going to come through. Yeah. Hallelujah. I don't believe in fairy tales. I guess I've outgrown them, but that doesn't mean that. I don't believe that there's something bigger than me Cause I've seen it in a hospital room But the doctor said sorry There's nothing more we can do Well it wasn't through I've never seen a pot of gold At the end of a rainbow But I've got a promise I can hold middle of a struggle God if you said it you'll perform it may not be how I want you to but here's what I'll do I'm gonna wait on you I'm gonna wait on you Jesus I tasted your goodness trusted your promise I'm gonna wait on you I 
know you've ordered every step. Yeah, you are the author. And there's no predicting what is next. But you hold the future. And all the questions, they come second to the one I know is true, yeah. You've always been true. So I'm gonna wait on you. I'm gonna wait on you. I've tasted your goodness. Trusted your promise. I'm gonna wait on you, yeah. I'm gonna wait on you, Jesus. I've tasted your goodness. Trusted your promise. I'm gonna wait on you. So wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord, He will renew your strength. So wait, I'll say, wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord, He will renew your strength. So wait, I'll say.
what you're waiting. It's about what you're doing while you're waiting. So instead of complaining, why don't we just start praising in the middle of the storm? Yeah. In the middle of the storm, yeah. about what you're doing while you're waiting so instead of complaining why don't we start raising in the middle of the storm yeah in the middle of the storm yeah hey that way on the lord shall renew new their strength they shall mount up up on wings like an eagle and so they shall walk and not get weary they shall run and not faint that's what happens when you wait that's what happens when you wait they that wait on the lord shall renew do their strength they shall mount up up on wings like an eagle and so they shall walk and not get weary. They shall run and not faint. That's what happens when you wait. That's what happens when you wait. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. He will renew your strength. So wait. Sometimes things don't happen before you get there. Sometimes you get there and you gotta wait and trust on him. And then when the Egyptians are barreling down towards you, he raises up a standard and the miracle happens, the water parts and you walk through. I don't pretend to understand how or why everything happens when it does or when it doesn't, but I know that he's a God that will never forsake you and he will always come through. So just wait on Him and draw yourself to Him. Yeah. Like that song, instead of complaining, why don't we just praise Him? Why don't we start praising Him? So the next time we're in a situation where we feel like we can just complain, 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 and don't get me wrong, I still do plenty of complaining, but 
why don't we next time we come into that situation think, you know what? Instead of complaining about why it hasn't happened yet or having to wait, I'm just going to praise Him. scripture in Isaiah 53 and also in 2 Peter where he says, you know, that by his stripes you are healed. And in Peter it says, by his stripes you were healed. You're already healed. And I say every time this disclaimer, I've had people uh, come against me. I had some people come against me when we were having a healing service. We were Facebook Live. And some people started saying, that's heresy. You're preaching a you know, heretical message. Uh, I'm not. They were saying that in Isaiah 53 when it says that by his stripes you were healed, that meant your sins were forgiven and you could go to heaven. Well, I challenge you. We've taught this many times before. I challenge you to go look up what the Hebrew words mean there. Get you a good concordance. Look it up online somewhere. The Blue Letter Bible is a good resource online. Look up when it says you, you were healed. You are healed by his stripes. It totally means like what a physician does. A cure. So we've taught that so many times, I'm not going to go back over that. But we call this by his stripes because we believe here that by his stripes, we're already healed. It's already happened by his blood. He can't shed any more blood. But guess what? Woo! His blood is still flowing in the spiritual realm for your healing. He's already paid the price. He can't go back and pray it, pay it again. So we are going to study this lesson tonight about healing, knowing that by his stripes, we are healed. This is session 35. So if you want the other healing sessions, Abigail and I can probably look them up for you and find, but find them. You let me know, and we will get you the other 34 sessions. Um, Malachi or somebody, could you turn that fan off? When that fan stirs up the dust on stage, I end up having to drink a lot of water to keep my throat. Okay. I did read Psalm 91 last healing seminar, which was, again, I think it was the last week of August. But I'm going to read it again, and this time I'm going to do it a little differently. I want you to know what this means, because people in the Christian realm, whew, I just felt the Holy Ghost. We have taken this scripture, which is powerful, and we have been quoting this over ourselves, over our homes, especially since the pandemic broke out in uh, March 2020, I think it was, when they locked everything down. This is a scripture, the whole psalm that people started just clinging to. But you know what? When I went back and reread it, I read it many, many times, and I began to really study what the words mean. It was It's so much deeper than we know. Um, my mother taught on this a few years ago and brought forth some great points. 
but there's even more that we're going to go into. So, I'm not going to read the entire thing right now. What I'm going to do is go little by little, and you'll see the words that are in bold. Those are words we're going to focus on, because I believe that at the end of this, your faith is going to be built even more so. Everybody's got faith. People say, I don't have faith. Yes, you do. The Bible says that he's given to every man the measure of faith. You have faith. But when you hear encouraging stories of healing, and you hear the word about healing, you can feel like your faith muscles being strengthened. So that's why I've chosen some specific words to help us grow stronger tonight. Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place. And if you see the, I'm going to, now let me pause again. When you see the little things in brackets, in italics, that means I went to other versions like the Amplified Bible, which gives you a little more of what the Hebrew really meant, and I put that there. So I didn't make this up. This actually came from the Amplified Translation. He that dwelleth in the secret place or in the shelter of the Most High shall abide, will rest under the shadow of the Almighty. Okay, I'm going to stop there. and Notice what I've done with your pages. Usually I do back and front, but I didn't this time because I want you to be able to look at both of them at the same time. So it's on two separate pages. goes against my saving paper mentality, but hey, it was important tonight to do this. So when you look at page two, you can see where I've broken it down. So we'll start at the beginning. He that dwelleth. Look at what that word dwelleth means. This is the Hebrew. I've taken the Hebrew and what it means. It means remains. He that remains. He that sits. He that abides. Oh, I like this next one. He that marries. I'm talking about being so closely attached to the Lord that, it, that you are just married and dwelling there with Him. That, so dwelleth means so much more than just dwelleth. So he that marries, he that abides in the secret place. In Hebrew, secret place. In English, it's two words. In Hebrew, it's one word. And look what it means. It's on your paper. It means covering, shelter, woo, hiding place, secrecy. So he that abides and dwells in that covering of the Most High. And when you look at that word Most High there, there are a lot of words for God in the Old Testament. There are many words. You know, you've heard of El Shaddai. You've heard of, they call it Yahweh, but it's more like, more like Yehovah was more what it was like. But here, Most High is the word for God, Elion. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard that, Elion. And it means an elevated place literally high up so i want you to think about the fact that he that's us he that dwells and sits and remains in the covering of the that that secret place of elion what it means is you're, you've been elevated i don't mean in an arrogant kind of way that you're better than others it simply means let me give you an example i have uh, some i don't have a lot of fancy dishes but i do have some that you know i don't want them to get broken I don't use them every day. So what I do is I put them up high on a shelf. So when I'm coming through the kitchen, barreling through, you know, I don't just knock it with my, with my elbow. I put it up high. That's what this is telling you here. That when you dwell in the secret place of the most high, you are being put up in a place where things can't reach you. Where the enemy can't get at you. You've been elevated because you're in him. You're in Elion, who is the most high. Still in verse 1. It said it will rest under the shadow of the Almighty. That word shadow in Hebrew means that you are being protected as if you were in the shade. It's a hot day. It's a miserable day. We were at a ball game the other day, and it was 92 in St. Louis, and it was hot in the Midwest. When it's hot, it's hot out there. And it was, it was really miserable on a lot of those people in the direct sun in the afternoon. But guess what? We had researched ahead and found tickets in a shaded section. And as we sat in the shade, I was perfectly fine, even though it was 92 degrees. I was shaded. I was protected. That is what this word means. In that shadow, that covering, it can even mean the wall of a city that's used for defense. I want you to think about that. Ooh, I just felt that. It's like he's got this wall of defense around us. So that word shadow means so much more. He's got you surrounded like the wall of a city. And you're dwelling in the shadow of the Almighty. This is another word for God here. The Almighty in Hebrew here is El Shaddai. Which means, that is like, means the Almighty God who totally provides and protects you. So you are dwelling. 
You are dwelling in that covering, in that shade of the most almighty God. Let's go to verse 2. I'll read the entire thing, then we'll break it down. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Let's break it down. I will say of the Lord. Now, when, you, when it says I will say of the Lord, it literally means you're going to say it. You're going to utter it. I teach all the time here, I preach all the time here, that it's important to give Him the fruit of your lips. To speak of, of God. I've had people tell me too many times to even think about, quit talking about God on Facebook. And all you do is talk about God. People don't need to talk about religion online. You know what? The Psalms tell us to publish His good works. Yeah. It tells us to speak it aloud. And if I can't speak to all my Facebook friends, the least I do is write it out what God is doing. So here, it literally means we speak this out. It says, I will say of the Lord, and the word for the Lord here is yet another word for God, and it is whew, the most holy name of God, which the Jews today won't even pronounce. In, uh, in our uh, system, consonant system, it would be like a Y-H-V-H. If you put the uh, vowel sounds with it, we don't know them exactly, but it's something like Yehovah. This is the most holy name of God. And you are saying here in verse 2, says, I will say of the Lord, Yehovah, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. Now that word for God is yet another word to describe God. It's the word Elohim. Ooh. And the word Elohim is a beautiful word. It can mean a lot of things, but it shows you God as ruler and God as judge. So when you're saying this, you're saying, I will say, of the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress. He is my ruler. He is my judge. In other words, nobody else out there can judge you. He's the only one you got to worry about is him. That's who you were saying he is here. You were saying in him will I trust. I love this Hebrew word for trust. Because in Hebrew, Hebrew is a very picturesque language. They give you pictures that go with the word. So you get this mental image. This word, trust, means you would, you would literally throw yourself down from a high height and know he would catch you. Is that not beautiful? Somebody ought to say amen. I can't even see y'all, but I can hear you if you say it. But you would literally be willing to just know that he's going to catch you. No matter from what height you fall, there he is. That's what that trust means. Total protection. I've never done that rope thing, you know, at camps and stuff where you have to, what is it you do? You have to trust your teammates at, on the ropes course or something to hold you. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. I love y'all, but I might be like, I don't know. Frankie might drop me. Allison might drop me. I know y'all wouldn't mean to, but he never will. And that's what this Hebrew word means. He never will. You can trust him. Let's go to verse 3. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome, which means perilous or deadly, pestilence. Let's go to that word deliver. Surely he shall. Now deliver is pretty good. I like that word. He shall deliver you. But in Hebrew, man, it means snatch away, rescue, save, strip, tear away from. And a snare here is literally like a snare that you would catch a bird in. I don't know that people do that anymore. I don't know. I mean, my family hunts, but I don't know if we ever had bird snares. But the fowler, he will, he will snatch you out of that bird trap of the fowler. Now, the fowler obviously represents anything evil that would come against you. A fowler here was somebody who would try to trap birds and work with birds. And he's saying, God is saying, he's going to snatch you. Anytime the fowler tries to catch you in that trap, God will snatch you. This is such a psalm of total trust in him. Let's go to verse 4. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. In other words, you shall take refuge. His truth, his faithfulness, shall be thy shield and buckler. On your other paper, you can see what the word cover means there. I love it. He shall cover you. Again, it's like he's going to hedge, put a hedge around you. He's going to fence around you. He's going to shut you in and screen you. He's going to cover you. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings. 
The word wings there can literally mean wings, like the wings of a bird, but it can also mean the fringes of a garment. Think about that. Think about the woman who came and touched the hem of his garment. There was a reason she did that. We have a whole healing lesson we did on that, where she touched the hem because his name was even written in those fringes, the zitzi of the, of the fringe of his garment. So that's also what this word can mean. He's going to cover you with his wings. It talks about the shield and buckler. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. His faithfulness. I love the word truth, but it also means in Hebrew faithfulness. His faithfulness is going to be your shield and your buckler. Now, in modern times, you know, we don't fight battles with shields and bucklers anymore. I mean, maybe they do in other countries. I don't. A shield, as you can imagine, is something you're going to hold. And it's usually something that you would deflect arrows. You know, arrows are going to come against you, and, and you've got the bigger shield here. A buckler is a smaller type of thing that you would fasten to your arm. And that would mean if somebody's coming up to you to try to stab you or something, you know, a closer blow, you could try to deflect it. If you're getting arrows over here and somebody's trying to stab you over here, you got that buckler that you're going to try to deflect their blows. This is what he does for us. His faithfulness is as this shield that protects us from the arrows of the wicked one. And it also is like that buckler that protects us when the enemy tries to get close and go, mm, and we go, uh -uh. Because it's him. It's him protecting us. Verse 5. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. 6. Nor for the pestilence that walketh. That word walketh. You know, when you walk, look at me. Leslie walketh. You know, she's walking. That word in Hebrew means stalks. Now that has a much more sinister feeling about it. Something that stalks you. So you are not <clears throat> going to be afraid for the pestilence that stalks you in darkness, nor for the destruction, which also means plague, that wasteth, which means destroys at noonday. So let's read it again with the new words there. Nor for the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor for the plague that destroys at noonday. Verse 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. It shall not come near thee. <clears throat> now, I won't confess to you something. I have misunderstood that verse maybe all my life. And maybe you have too, but when I did research and looked into what the words really mean, I see it a whole different way. I'm not saying our old way is necessarily incorrect, but I, I think it, it may be. Y'all see, pray to the Lord and see what you feel. When it uses this word side, and it talks about a thousand falling at your side, and it's on your paper, you can see, what, and I'll read it. I keep forgetting that people on camera don't have a paper. When they watch it later, they need to see what this says. Verse 7, side, as in an adversary falling instead of attacking you. A thousand shall fall at thy side. It's like an adversary that was coming to attack you falls. I used to think that it meant that even when there was this plague in the land, a thousand people might get hit with it, or, or many thousands might get hit with it, but not me. But what it's actually saying here is that the enemy that's coming against you, even if there's a thousand enemies coming against you, or something in the strength, like a plague, in the strength of a thousand enemies, it's going to fall at your side. You see that? That change. You see that, Meg? I heard a yell from my daughter. That totally changed. Because I used to think, well, man, I don't want to see everybody all my, you know, everybody die by my side. Because I used to think it meant a thousand people are going to get sick and fall by, beside you and 10,000 over here. But it ain't going to touch you. It's talking about the adversary that's coming against you. A thousand over here, 10,000 over here. It's going to fall away. In other words, the numbers are big. It gets bigger into the multi-thousands just to show you how powerful God is, that it's not going to touch you. Totally changes the way I looked at that after all these years. Let's go to verse 8. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Number 9, verse 9. Because thou hast made the Lord. All right, here we go. This is one of my favorites. 
Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. Now, I have habitation in dark print. It's not on your paper. I have it bolded. But I had it there so I could remember to, to talk to you about what this means. God showed me this in such a different way when it came to COVID-19. And I mentioned this briefly at the last healing service. We quote, I want you to look at verse 10. Go ahead and jump ahead to 10. We quote this a lot in the Pentecostal realms when it comes to sickness, when it comes to, especially since COVID broke out. We say, there shall no evil befall me, nor any plague come nigh my dwelling. I've been quoting it for two and a half years, day and night, before I go to bed every night. When I get up every morning, I pretty much quote this verse, verse 10. I, I especially quote the last part. There's no plague going to come nigh my dwelling. God showed me a different way to look at this that just was mind-blowing to me. It, you may be like, I don't, uh, not to me, but to me, I'm like, whoo. That verse doesn't start there. It doesn't start at verse 10. The sentence doesn't. It starts in verse 9. Because I was always envisioning, you know, that um, here I am doing my thing at my house, and Lord, I need you to come over here and, you know, help me out, protect me. I was trying to tell the Lord what to do, but you know what I'm saying. It was kind of like, I'll do, I'll do what I'm going to do, and I expect the Lord to back me up and partner with me. People of God, it's the other way around. We're supposed to partner with Him. So when you go back and realize that verse 10 that we quote so often, actually that sentence starts in verse 9, and it starts with a because. Now when you hear a because, it means that what's going to follow that because is um, dependent on something else. So when you say no plague is going to come nigh your dwelling, no evil is going to befall you, that is because of what happens in verse 9. Because you have made the Lord your habitation. And there's an, an amplified version of that too in brackets there. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling place, then right. no evil shall befall you. Right. Then no plague shall come nigh your dwelling. People of God, we got it. We got it. We're looking at it in a different way. We're supposed to partner with Him. I was looking at it like this is my house. Alan and I, we pay for this house. Now, Lord, I need you to come. No plague come nigh my dwelling. You protect it. But people of God, if we are in habitation with him, it's a whole different direction. Instead of him coming on over here where we are, no. We twine ourselves up and we are in him. We are in habitation with him because we have made him our habitation. No plague can come nigh my dwelling. How can I, if I'm in him... And I realize that I'm not just trying to get him to come, you know, help me, Lord, bless me, partner with me. No, no, Lord, I'm going to partner with you, Lord. I'm going to just, I'm going to snuggle up in you, Lord. You are my habitation. Yes, right. How can a plague come nigh that dwelling? Yeah. Because you're in him. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. We're not just talking about your house or something. We're talking about he is your dwelling. Habitation yeah. is where you live. That's your dwelling. So when he is your habitation... That's what it means with that dwelling. No plague shall come nigh that dwelling because you're in Him. That changed my whole thought process. When I pray every day now, and quote, I quote these verses now, but now I quote verse 9 with verse 10. And when I do, I see, I envision myself in Him. I am so in habitation with Him. you got people not living. I'm not talking about y'all. I believe it's a holy lot of folks here. I really do. not just saying that. You got a lot of people who say, "Oh, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus, and you know, I'm saved." And they're living their own lives. They're living and doing exactly what they want to do, and expecting God to bless it. That's backwards. So you got people saying, oh, "I just don't understand. God just just don't feel like He's protecting me." It's because those people are living their own life. They've not made Him their habitation. But I believe this is a people here who, if we haven't made Him our habitation, that's going to be our heart's cry. That's mine for the rest of my life. God, you are my habitation. And when I'm in you, uh-uh, nothing can touch that. Let's continue. Let's go to verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep you, to guard you in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up, lift you up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. 
Now, I didn't highlight a word there, but you can see on your page, I say verse 13, may be used figuratively to mean the demons and the devil. In other words, you can tread all these things. How do we know that? The New Testament backs that up. The New Testament tells us that we're going to be able to tread on the things of the enemy. We are walking on them. They are under our feet. And that's what it's saying here. We have that power only through him. Let's pick it up with verse 14. Because he hath set his love upon me. Now wait a minute. All of a sudden, the psalmist has been talking from a different point of view. He has been talking as if saying, and the Lord's going to do this. If we do this, the Lord's going to do this. Now all of a sudden, God is talking. God starts being the speaker here. And he says in this verse, because he, as in you, as in me, because they have set their love upon me, he's saying, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Oh, God, because he's known my name. The Amplified Version says this in verse 14. Because he loves me. I want you to think about that he as you. That's you, God's people. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him because he acknowledges my name. That's talking about you. That's God talking about you now. In verse 14, when it says, set his love, look what it says on your paper. It says, because he has set his, that's you and me. We've set our love upon him. What does that mean we're doing? And I want you to ask the Holy Ghost to quicken you and to, to make this real to you that if you're not doing this, that you're going to do this. Because to set your love upon him means this, to cling to to join, to be attached to, to love, to delight in. That's what it means when you set your love upon Him. You cling to Him. You delight in Him. I also, in bold, I have, I will set Him on high. That is, we'll set Him on Five words in English. In Hebrew, this is usually just one word. That in English, we have to have more words to translate. What does that mean? It's on your paper. It means I will exalt him. Oh, I love this. So he is inaccessible. He is safe from attack, from evil. We take that scripture and we think it means that, hey, if we trust in God, he's going to exalt us and bless us and put us above our fellows. What it means in this sense right here is that he's going to put you in a place that makes you inaccessible. That means that evil things cannot get access to you. He's going to exalt you. That literally means exalt, to lift you up, not in arrogance or pride, obviously, but to lift you up to a place where nothing can touch you. There is, there is a place in Him where all of this is true. When we cling to Him, when we're joined with Him, when we've made Him our habitation, all of this bears true, bears witness in our lives. So when it says he will set us on high, he's going to keep us safe from attack from evil because we've been set above it. It says, I will set him on high because he hath known my name. It's on your paper, name. It, people take this and say, well, I know the name of Jesus. I just claim that name of Jesus. And the name of Jesus is powerful, Yeshua. Jesus, powerful. But name in Hebrew, Hashem, means so much more than just the literal name. Look at what it means on your paper. It means his reputation, his fame, and his glory. God's going to set his people all high and make them inaccessible where evil can't touch them because they know who he is. They know his reputation. They know his glory. Not just they know that his name is something we repeat and say Jesus, but because we know what that name means. That's powerful when you really think about it. Almost done here with these, and we're going to have our time of prayer. Verse 15. Still talking about you. This is still God talking about you and me. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. 
uh, and honor him. Look at deliver on your paper. Verse 15, deliver. It says, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. I will pull him away from danger. I will take him away from danger. Not only that, look at this, y'all. I will equip and arm him for the fight to strengthen and prepare him. That's what that word deliver means. It means all of those things. He says, if you're in trouble, like Elijah was saying earlier, sometimes things can happen like that. Sometimes there's an appointed time. Sometimes he's going to pick you right up out of it, but sometimes he's going to arm you and prepare you and equip you that you fight it in his name and you see it go. That's what that word deliver means. It's so powerful. I will deliver him and honor him. The word honor there, I, don't, I didn't put all of the Hebrew words on your page, but that one I did. I showed you how it's pronounced. The word honor is kabad. If you, if you know anything about the word for glory in the Bible, the word like kavod, very kin to this. They are cousin words, you could say. So when he says, I will honor him, kavod, it means that it, it is heaviness in a good sense. In other words, things will be numerous. You will thrive, rich, abounding, honorable. That's what all that means. That your life, and I'm not talking about you're going to suddenly become a millionaire, but hey, if it's God's will, you will. And you'll give to the cause of the Lord from that million you get. But what he's talking about here is the richness of life. He gives you this abundant life. That's what it means when he says, I will honor him. And finally, the last verse, 16. With long life, he's still talking to you. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Megan, if you're not taking any more notes, I know you take notes. Can you just go ahead and start playing up here behind us? <laughs> With long life, will I satisfy him? That's you and me. How would satisfy mean? I mean, I think we know what it means, but here's what in the Hebrew. It means to feel, to satisfaction, to have enough. To feel full, to have plenty of, to be satiated. To have enough. He's going to satisfy you with long life. Now you, you can't just claim that promise, you know, he's going to satisfy me. It says because he set his love on me. God has said that those are my people who have set their love on me and I'm their habitation. He said I'm going to satisfy them with long life. And that satisfy means enough. For somebody enough might be uh, 70. For somebody enough might be 100. You know, it's going to be different for everybody when that time comes. But it will be enough when he chooses. Not when the enemy tries to take us out. But when he chooses, it will be enough. It will be satisfactory. And that final word, I saved it. It was at the end, but it is the perfect ending. When he says in verse 16, I will show him my salvation. This is Old Testament. But the word used there is the word that is the name of Jesus. Jesus is a, is a beautiful name. I love to say it. But it's a Greek version of the real name. And the real name is on your paper there. Verse 16, salvation in Hebrew is the word Yeshua. Yeshua. Look at what it means. It means deliverance, aid, victory, prosperity, health, and welfare. God says, that person who trusts me, that person who sets his love on me, that person who recognizes my name, acknowledges my reputation, that person, he said, I'm going to show them my salvation. Woo! I'm going to show them Yeshua, which is everything you will ever need. Yeshua, salvation. Yeshua, help. Yeshua, the aid and trouble that you need. Yeshua, He will show us His salvation. It is so important right now, people of God, that we abide in Him. I had put a verse on the front of this page. Yeah, come on up, Lodge. Hello, good to whoever's singing. John 15, 7 says, this is Jesus talking. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. I mean, I didn't make that up. I can't lie. People say, well, not me. It didn't happen for me. He, he said, if you abide in me, 
my words abide in you, he said, you shall ask what you want, what you will. Now, obviously, this is in the will of God. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done for you. Now, there's those of you right here, and me included. We need a miracle from God this night. And I can promise you that this miracle of healing that you need, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, whatever it is, I promise you, it's His will. You don't have to come up here and say, well, Sister Leslie, I want you to pray for me that if it be His will, I'll be healed. I'm not going to pray that. It is His will. It already is. You don't have an instance in the Bible where He said, oh, I don't think it's really my will to heal her, but I'll heal her. If you can find it, bring it to me. It's not there. It is His will that you be whole. Spirit, soul, and body. So the first plea that I make here is if you don't know Him, oh God, if you don't know Him, I think people here do, but I can't judge your heart. Maybe somebody watching needs to hear this later when they watch. If you don't know Him, don't delay. This is it. Let this be the day that you say, oh God, I repent of my sins. That lifestyle I've been living. And Lord, I want to follow you. I receive your blood sacrifice. I believe you are Lord. And I want you to be Lord of my life. I want to follow you. Not just believe mentally, but believe here. And secondly, if you do know him already, but you've heard what Psalm 91 says, and you say, I, I want to be in, in habitation with him. I want to cling to him more than I've been doing. You know all you got to do? Just, just repent. It's that easy. Just repent. Say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I've not been following you the way I know I need to. And I'm sorry. Don't be guilty and go home and still, you know. No. And repent and it's done. And then ask him, say, Lord, I just want to, from this, I want a clean start right now to cling to you, closer to you. You are my habitation. And no evil can come nigh the dwelling of God. If you need healing of any kind and you want agreement, come up here. Let us pray for you. I'm going to have you pray again for me. So if you need any kind of prayer, remember, it's not just physical. It can be mental, emotional. Come up here and let the saints of God agree with you. We can anoint you with oil. That's biblical. In James, any sick among you, it says, let, the, let them come on and the elders of the church anoint them with oil. They'll pray the prayer of faith and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. I'm going to put this down and let whoever's going to sing or if anybody feels to say something, say it. If you got a revelation from God regarding what we've just heard, this is a powerful song. We'd love to hear it. But at this point, we're going to pray for those who have a need and I'm expecting miracles.
How I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my
God with the voice of triumph. We lift your name up. We lift your name up. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph. Shout out to God with the voice of praise. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph. We lift your name up. I really felt with a lot of people that came forth, there's been almost a spirit of a grief attached to a lot of these needs. Not all of them, but some of them. Like, I could feel like this spirit of grief. Like, a, a worldly sorrow that's not, a, you know, godly sorrow works to repentance. There's a difference there. But there is such a thing as a literal uh, demonic spirit of grief, which it can grab hold of you. It's natural to grieve when you lose somebody. Goodness gracious, we cry. I understand that. But when it lingers and lingers, sometimes there's a spirit of grief that's just trying to keep you down, trying to keep you pulled down. Even if it's grief over past memories, it doesn't have to be a death or something. It could just be a, a past something that happened in your life and there's this grief that just keeps coming back and trying to, to grab you to make you think about the sadness of what used to be or what didn't work out or what didn't happen for you. This is a night for that to be gone. So if you need prayer for that, we've already had prayer up here for that. And people have felt some deliverance here. If you need prayer for that, you come up. It may not be that you've got a headache or a backache, but there's some grief that you just feel keeps trying to come back on you from the past or a loss. Again, it doesn't have to be death. It could be the loss of a relationship. Even. If you need prayer, you come up here. And I want y'all to uh, agree with me. I'm speaking the word over this sis. I do not want to have to go back and have a procedure done again. I want it gone. I want it to dry up and be cursed in the root. And that's what I speak over it daily. And I just ask an agreement from you all. Just 
where he said he was just playing basketball, practicing basketball today, and he just pushed one way and it just like popped. So I'm just going to pray right now because I thought that's crazy that he texted me right when we're having a healing service. So I just want us to pray right now and believe that he's going to be healed and recovered and back at it in no time. God, right now we just pray for Larson, God. We thank you and praise you for Larson, God. We thank you for who he is, the gifts you've given him, God, and all that you've called him to be. And God, right now in Jesus' name, we come together in agreement. We bind together in agreement to say that we're declaring healing over Larson's ankle, over any tendons or joints or ligaments or muscles. Any damage that was done to anything in his ankle or in his foot must go in Jesus' name. I'm just declaring inflammation and swelling to go down in Jesus' name. Bruising to just gut vanish in Jesus' name. Strength to come back into his bone and his muscle, tendons, all of it in Jesus' name right now. We're just declaring healing over Larson's ankle in Jesus name no more pain no more swelling no more inflammation complete healing and wholeness in his ankle in Jesus name we praise you and thank you God for the healing in his ankle
speaking the word, but I do believe, I know there's power in agreement. He hurt his back playing baseball. He pulled a muscle, strained a muscle, and it was it was pretty bad for a couple of weeks. He was okay riding. That's why we were able to go on the trip, because riding, he just sits. It's when he tries to get up and down and move that it was hurting. That is much improved, but when he went for the x-ray to make sure there wasn't structural damage that was causing all this pain, and he said, I can tell you all this. They, um, they called him and said, we have diagnosed you now with degenerative disc disease and a, I guess adult onset scoliosis. We don't receive that. I'm not saying that the doctors, I love good doctors and I, uh, they saw what they saw. But just because you're diagnosed with something doesn't mean you have to receive it into yourself and say, this is mine, I have this. The truth, the facts may be that they see that in the x-ray, but the truth of Jesus is that he's Alan's healed. There's a difference there in the spiritual kingdom and the natural kingdom. So we are already believing that he's healed. We're not going to say he has degenerative disc disease, he has scoliosis. We're going to praise God that he's healed of that. So I want you to agree with us in joy and praise that he's healed. 
no issues in his back there. So if you would, let's just agree with Alan. needed to agree with him like they agreed for me, for his back. 